Welcome to the sci fiology podcast, where we hope to dig up some of the gems of sci-fi past and present them to you right here for your listening pleasure. I am Scott Johnson, your host of this journey, and my goal is to stop these golden age science fiction stories from being lost in space. Today's story is a continuation of The Color Out of Space by H.P. Lovecraft. This story was published in Amazing Stories in 1927. So without further ado, here is part two of The Color Out of Space. On the 19th of October, Nahum staggered into Ami's house with hideous news. The death had come to poor Thaddeus in his attic room, and it had come in a way which could not be told. Nahum had dug a grave in the railed family plot behind the farm, and he had put therein what he found. There could have been nothing from outside, for the small barred window and locked door were intact. But it was as much as it had been in the barn. Ami and his wife consoled the stricken man as best they could, but shuddered as they did so. Stark terror seemed to cling round the gardeners and all they touched, and the very presence of one in the house was a breath from regions unnamed and unnameable. Ami accompanied Nahum home with the greatest reluctance, and did what he might to calm the hysterical sobbing of little Merwin. Zenus needed no calming. He had come of late to do nothing but stare into space and obey what his father told him, and Ami thought that his fate was very merciful. Now and then Merwin's screams were answered faintly from the attic, and in response to an inquiring look, Nahum said that his wife was getting very feeble. When night approached, Ami managed to get away, for not even friendship could make him stay in that spot when the faint glow of the vegetation began and the trees may or may not have swayed without the wind. It was really lucky for Ami that he was not more imaginative. Even as things were, his mind was bent ever so slightly. But had he been able to connect and reflect upon all the portents around him, he must inevitably have turned a total maniac. In the twilight, he hastened home, the screams of the madwoman and the nervous child ringing horrible in his ears. Three days later, Nahum burst into Ami's kitchen in the early morning, and in the absence of his host, stammered out a desperate tale once more. While Mrs. Pierce listened in a clutching fright, it was little Merwin this time. He was gone. He had gone out late at night with a lantern and pail for water, and had never come back. He'd been going to pieces for days and hardly knew what he was about, screamed at everything. There had been a frantic shriek from the yard then, but before the father could get to the door, the boy was gone. There was no glow from the lantern he had taken, and of the child himself, no trace. At the time, Nahum thought the lantern and pail were gone too, but when dawn came and the man had plodded back from his all-night search of the woods and fields, he had found some very curious things near the well. There was a crushed and apparently somewhat melted mass of iron, which had certainly been the lantern, while a bent pail and twisted iron hoop beside it, both half-fused, seemed to hint at the remnants of the pail. That was all. Nahum was past imagining, Mrs. Pierce was blank, and Ami, when he had reached home and heard the tale, could give no guess. Merwin was gone and there would be no use in telling people around who shunned all gardeners now. No use either in telling the city people at Arkham who laughed at everything. Thad was gone, and now Merwin was gone. Something was creeping and creeping and waiting to be seen and heard. Nahum would go soon, and he wanted Ami to look after his wife and Zenus if they survived him. It must all be a judgment of some sort, though he could not fancy what for since... He had always walked uprightly in the Lord's ways, so far as he knew. For over two weeks, Ami saw nothing of Nahum, and then worried about what might have happened, he overcame his fears and paid the gardener a place a visit. There was no smoke from the great chimney, and for a moment the visitor was apprehensive of the worst. The aspect of the whole farm was shocking, grayish withered grass and leaves on the ground, vines falling in brittle wreckage from archaic walls and gables, and great bare trees clawing up at the gray November sky with a studied malevolence which Ami could not but feel had come from some subtle change in the tilt of the branches. But Nahum was alive, after all. 
He was weak and lying in a couch in the low-sealed kitchen, but perfectly conscious and able to give simple orders to Zenus. The room was deadly cold, and as Ami visibly shivered, the host shouted huskily to Zenus for more wood. Wood, indeed, was sorely needed, since the cavernous fireplace was unlit and empty, with a cloud of soot blowing about in the chill wind that came down the chimney. Presently, Nahum asked him if the extra wood had made him any more comfortable, and then Ami saw what had happened. The stoutest cord had broken at last, and the hapless farmer's mind was proof against more sorrow. Questioning tactfully, Ami could get no clear data at all about the missing Zenus. In the whale. He lives in the whale, was all that the clouded father would say. Then there flashed across the visitor's mind a sudden thought of the mad wife, and he changed his line of inquiry. Nabby? Why, here she is, was the surprised response of poor Nahum and Abby soon saw that he must search for himself. Leaving the harmless babbler on the couch, he took the keys from their nail beside the door and climbed the creaking stairs to the attic. It was very close and noisome up there, and no sound could be heard from any direction. Of the four doors in sight, only one was locked, and on this he tried various keys on the ring he had taken. The third proved to be the right one, and after some fumbling, Ami threw open the low, white door. It was quite dark inside, for the window was small and half obscured by the crude wooden bars, and Ami could see nothing at all on the wide planked floor. The stench was beyond enduring, and before proceeding further, he had to retreat to another room and return with lungs filled with breathable air. When he did enter, he saw something dark in the corner, and upon seeing it more clearly, he screamed outright. While he screamed, he thought a momentary cloud ellipsed the window, and a second later he felt himself brushed as if by some hateful current of vapor. Strange colors danced before his eyes. And had not a present horror numbed him, he would have thought of the globule in the meteor that the geologist's hammer had shattered, and of the morbid vegetation that had sprouted in the spring. As it was, he thought only of the blasphemous monstrosity which confronted him, and which all too clearly had shared the nameless fate of young Thaddeus and the livestock. But the terrible thing about the horror was that it very slowly and perceptibly moved as it continued to crumble. Ami would give me no added particulars of this scene, but the shape in the corners does not reappear in his tail as a moving object. There are things which cannot be mentioned, and what is done in common humanity is sometimes cruelly judged by the law. I gathered that no moving thing was left in that attic room, and that to leave anything capable of motion there would have been a deed so monstrous as to damn any accountable being to eternal torment. Anyone but a stolid farmer would have fainted or gone mad, but Ami walked conscious through that low doorway and locked the accursed secret behind him. There would be Nahum to deal with now. He must be fed and tended and removed to some place where he could be cared for. Commencing his descent of the dark stairs, Ami heard a thud below him. He even thought a scream had been suddenly choked off and recalled nervously the clammy vapor which had brushed by him in that frightful room above. What presence had his cry and entry started up? Halted by some vague fear, he heard still further sounds below. Indubitably, there was a sort of heavy dragging and a most detestably sticky noise as if some fiendish and unclean species of suction. With an associative sense goaded to feverish heights, he thought unaccountably of what he had seen upstairs. Good God, what eldritch dream world was this into which he had blundered? He dared move neither backward nor forward, but stood there, trembling at the black curve of the boxed-in staircase. Every trifle of the scene burned itself into his brain. The sounds, the sense of dread expectancy, the darkness, the steepness of the narrow steps, and merciful heaven, the faint but unmistakable luminosity of all the woodwork in sight. Steps, sides, exposed lays, and beams alike. Then there burst forth a frantic whinny from Ami's horse outside. 
followed at once by a clatter which told of a frenzied runaway. In another moment, a horse and buggy had gone beyond earshot, leaving the frightened man on the dark stairs to guess what had sent them. But that was not all. There had been another sound out there, a sort of liquid splash, water. It must have been the well. He had left Hero untied near it, and a buggy wheel must have brushed the coping and knocked in a stone. And still, the pale phosphorescent glowed in that detestably ancient woodwork. God, how old the house was. Most of it built before 1700. A feeble scratching on the floor downstairs now sounded distinctly, and Ami's grip tightened on a heavy stick he had picked up in the attic for some purpose. Slowly nerving himself, he finished his descent and walked boldly toward the kitchen. But he did not complete the walk because what he sought was no longer there. It had come to meet him, and it was still alive after a fashion. Whether it had crawled or whether it had been dragged by any external forces, Ami could not say. But the death had been at it. Everything had happened in the last half hour, but collapse, graying, and disintegration were already far advanced. There was a horrible brittleness, and dry fragments were scaling off. Ami could not touch it, but looked horrifiedly into the distorted parody that had been a face. What was it, Nahum? What was it? He whispered, and the cleft, bulging lips were just about able to crackle out a final answer. Nothing. Nothing. The color, it burns. Cold and wet, but it burns. It lived in the well. I seen it. A kind of smoke, just like the flowers last spring. The well shone at night, Thad and Merwin and Zenith. Everything alive, sucking the life out of everything. In that stone, it must have come in that stone, pies in the whole place. Don't know what it wants. That round thing them men from the college dug out of the stone smashed it. It was that same color. Just the same like the flowers and plants. Must have been more of them. Seeds. Seeds. They growed. I seen it the first time this week. Must have got strong on Zenus. He was a big boy, full of life. It beats down your mind and then gets you, burns you up. In the well water. He was right about that. Evil water. Zenus never come back from the well. Can't get away. Draws you. You know something's coming, but it ain't no use. I seen it time and again, Zenus was took. Where's Nabby, Ami? My head's no good. Don't know how long since I fed her. It'll get her if we ain't careful, just to color. Her face is getting to have that color sometimes towards the night, and it burns and sucks. It comes from some place where things ain't as they is here. One of them professors said so. He was right. Look out, Ami. It'll do something more. Sucks the life out. But that was all. That which spoke could speak no more because it completely caved in. Ami laid a red checkered tablecloth over what was left and reeled out the back door into the fields. He climbed the slope to the ten-acre pasture and stumbled home by the north road in the woods. He could not pass that well from which his horses had run away. He had looked at it through the window and had seen that no stone was missing from the rim. Then the lurching buggy had not dislodged anything after all. The splash had been something else something which went into the well after it had done with poor Nahum. When Ami reached his house, the horses and buggy had arrived before him and thrown his wife into fits of anxiety. Reassuring her without explanations, he set out once again for Arkham and notified the authorities that the Gardner family was no more. He indulged in no details, but merely told the deaths of Nabi and Nahum that of Thaddeus being already known, and mentioned that the cause seemed to be the same strange ailment which had killed the livestock. 
He also stated that Merwin and Zenas had disappeared. There was considerable questioning at the police station, and, in the end, Ami was compelled to take the three officers to the gardener farm, together with the coroner, the medical examiner, and the veterinary who had treated the diseased animals. He went much against his will, for the afternoon was advancing, and he feared the fall of night over that accursed place. But it was some comfort to have so many people with him. The six men drove out in a Democrat wagon, following Ami's buggy, and arrived at the pest-ridden farmhouse at about four o'clock. Used as the officers were to gruesome experiences, not one remained unmoved at what was found in the attic and under the red checkered tablecloth on the floor below. The whole aspect of the farm with its gray desolation was terrible enough, but those two crumbling objects were beyond all bounds. No one could look long at them, and even the medical examiner admitted that there was very little to examine. Specimens could be analyzed, of course, so he busied himself in obtaining them. And here it develops that a very puzzling aftermath occurred at the college laboratory where the two files of dust were finally taken. Under the spectroscope, both samples gave off an unknown spectrum, in which many of the baffling bands were precisely like those which the strange meteor had yielded in the previous year. The property of emitting this spectrum vanished in a month, and the dust thereafter consisting mainly of alkaline phosphates and carbonates. Ami would not have told the men about the well if they had thought they meant to do anything then and there. It was getting towards sunset, and he was anxious to be away, but he could not help glancing nervously at the stony curb by the great sweep. And when a detective questioned him, he admitted that Nahum had feared something down there, so much so that he had never thought of searching it for Merwin or Zenas. After that, nothing would do but that they empty and explore the well immediately. So Ami had to wait trembling, while pail after pail of rank water was hauled and splashed on the soaking ground outside. The men sniffed in disgust at the fluid and, toward the last, held their noses against the fetid odor they were uncovering. It was not so long a job as they feared it would be, since the water was phenomenally low. There is no need to speak too exactly of what they found. Merwin and Zenas were both there, in part, though the vestiges were mainly skeletal. There were also a small deer and a dog about the same state, and a number of bones of smaller animals. The ooze and slime at the bottom seemed inexplicably porous and bubbling, and a man who descended on handholds with a long pole found that he could sink the wooden shaft to any depth in the mud of the floor without meeting any solid obstruction. Twilight had now fallen, and lanterns were brought from the house. Then, when it was seen that nothing further could be gained from the well, Everyone went indoors and conferred in the ancient sitting room, while the intermittent light of a spectral half-moon played wanely on the gray desolation outside. The men were frankly nonplussed by the entire case, and could find no convincing common element to link the strange vegetable conditions, the unknown disease of livestock and humans, and the unaccountable deaths of Merwin and Zenas in the tainted well. They had heard the common country talk, it is true, but could not believe that anything contrary to natural law had occurred. No doubt the meteor had poisoned the soil, but the illness of person and animals who had eaten nothing grown in that soil was another matter. Was it the well water? Very possibly. It might be a good idea to analyze it. But what particular madness could have made both boys jump into the well? Their deeds were so similar and the fragments showed that they had both suffered from the gray, brittle death. Why was everything so gray and brittle? It was the coroner, seated near a window overlooking the yard, who first noticed the glow about the well. Night had fully set in, and all the abhorrent ground seemed faintly luminous with more than the fitful moonbeams. But this new glow was something definite and distinct and appeared to shoot up from the black pit like a softened ray from a searchlight, giving dull reflections in the little ground pools where the water had been emptied. It had a very queer color, and as all the men clustered around the window, Ami gave a violent start. For this strange beam of ghastly miasma was to him of no unfamiliar hue. He had seen that color before, and feared to think what it might mean. He had seen it in the nasty, brittle globule in that aerolite two summers ago. He had seen it in the crazy vegetation of the springtime, and had thought he had seen it 
For an instant, that very morning against the small barred window of that terrible attic room where nameless things had happened. It had flashed there a second, and a clammy and hateful current of vapor had brushed past him. And then poor Nahum had been taken by something of that color. He had said so at the last, said it was like the globule on the plants. After that had come the runaway in the yard, and the splash in the well. And now that well was belching forth to the night, a pale, insidious beam of the same demonic taint. It does credit to the alertness of Ami's mind that he puzzled even at that tense moment over a point which was essentially scientific. He could not but wonder at his gleaning of the same impression from a vapor glimpsed in the daytime against a window opening in the morning sky and from a nocturnal exhalation seen as a phosphorescent mist against the black and blasted landscape. It wasn't right. It was against nature. And he thought of those terrible last words of his stricken friend, it come from some place where things ain't as they is here. One of them professors said so. All three horses outside, tied to a pair of shriveled saplings by the road, were now neighing and pawing frantically. The wagon driver started for the door to do something, but Ami laid a shaky hand on his shoulder. Don't go out there, he whispered. There's more to this than nor we know. Nahum said something lived in the well that sucks your life out. He said it must have something growed out of a round ball like the one we said in the meteor stone that fell a year ago in June. Sucks and burns, he said, and is just a cloud of color like that light out there now that you can hardly see and can't tell what it is. Nahum thought it feeds on everything living and gets stronger all the time. He said he's seen it this last week. It must be something far away from the sky like the men in the college last year says the meteor stone was. The way it's made and the way it works ain't like no way of God's world. It's summit from beyond. So the men paused indecisively as the light from the well grew stronger and the hitched horses pawed and whinnied in increasing frenzy. It was truly an awful moment. With terror in that ancient and accursed house itself, four monstrous sets of fragments, two from the house and two from the well, in the woodshed behind, and that shaft of unknown and unholy iridescence from the slimy depths in front. Ami had restrained the driver on impulse, forgetting how uninjured he himself was after the clammy brushing of that colored vapor in the attic room. But perhaps it is just as well that he acted as he did. No one will ever know what was abroad that night, and though the blasphemy from beyond had not so far hurt any human of unweakened mind, there is no telling what it might not have done at that last moment, and with its seemingly increased strength and the special signs of purpose, it was soon to display beneath the half-clouded, moonlit sky. All at once, one of the detectives at the window gave a sharp, short gasp. The others looked at him and then quickly followed his own gaze upward to the point at which its idle straying had been suddenly arrested. There was no need for words. What had been disputed in country gossip was disputable no longer, and it is because of the thing which every man in that party agreed in whispering later on, that strange days are never talked about in Arkham. It is necessary to premise that there was no wind at the hour of the evening. One did arise not long afterward, but there was absolutely none then. Even the dry tips of the lingering hedge mustard, gray and blighted, and the fringe on the roof of the standing Democrat wagon were unstirred. And yet, amid that tense, godless calm, the high bare boughs of all the trees in the yard were moving. They were twitching morbidly and spasmodically, clawing in convulsive and epileptic madness at the moonlit clouds, scratching impotently in the noxious air as if jerked by some allied and bodiless line of linkage with subterranean horrors writhing and struggling below the black roots. Not a man breathed for several seconds. Then a cloud of darker depth passed over the moon, and a silhouette of the clutching branches faded out momentarily. At this, there was a general cry, muffled with awe, but husky and almost identical from every throat. For the terror had not faded with the silhouette, and in a fearsome instant of deeper darkness, the watchers saw, wriggling at the treetop height, a thousand tiny points of faint and unhallowed radiance, tipping each bough like fire of St. Elmo or the flames that come down upon the apostle's head at Pentecost. 
It was a monstrous constellation of unnatural light, like a gutted swarm of corpse-fed fireflies dancing hellish sarabands over an accursed marsh. And its color was that same nameless intrusion which Ami had come to recognize and dread. All the while, the shaft of phosphorescence from the well was getting brighter and brighter, bringing to the minds of the huddled men a sense of doom and abnormality which far outraced any image their conscious minds could form. It was no longer shining out, it was pouring out. And as the shapeless stream of unplaceable color left the well, it seemed to flow directly into the sky. The veterinary shivered and walked to the front door to drop the heavy extra bar across it. Ami shook no less and had to tug and point for lack of a controllable voice when he wished to draw notice to the growing luminosity of the trees. The neighing and stamping of the horses had become utterly frightful, but not a soul of that group in the old house would have ventured forth for any earthly reward. Within moments, the shining of the trees increased, while their restless branches seemed to strain more and more toward verticality. The wood of the well sweep was shining now, and presently a policeman dumbly pointed to some wooden sheds and beehives near the stone wall on the west. They were commencing to shine, too, though the tethered vehicles of the visitors seemed so far unaffected. Then there was a wild commotion and clopping in the road, and as Ami quenched the lamp for better seeing, they realized that the span of frantic greys had broken their sapling and run off with the Democrat wagon. The shock served to loosen several tongues, and embarrassed whispers were exchanged. It spreads on everything organic that's been around here, muttered the medical examiner. No one replied, but the man who had been in the well gave a hint that his long pole must have stirred up something intangible. It was awful, he added. There was no bottom at all, just ooze and bubbles and the feeling of something lurking under there. Ami's horse still pawed and screamed deafeningly in the road outside, and nearly drowned its owner's faint quaver as he mumbled his formless reflections. It come from that stone. It growed down thar. It got everything living. It fed itself on a mind and body, Thad and Merwin, Zenus and Nabby. Nahum was the last. They all drunk the water. It got strong on them. It come from beyond where things ain't like they be here now. Now it's going home. At this point, as the column of unknown color flared suddenly stronger and began to weave itself into fantastic suggestions of shape which each spectator later described differently, there came from poor tethered hero such a sound as no man before or since had ever heard from a horse. Every person in that low-pitched sitting room stopped his ears, and Ami turned away from the window in horror and nausea. Words could not convey it. When Ami looked out again, the hapless beast lay huddled inert on the moonlit ground between the splintered shafts of the buggy. That was the last of Hero till they buried him the next day. But the present was no time to mourn, for almost at this instant, a detective silently called attention to something terrible in the very room with them. In the absence of the lamplight, it was clear that a faint phosphorescence had begun to pervade the entire apartment. It glowed on the broad planked floor where the rag carpet left it bare and shimmered over the sashes of the small paned windows. It ran up and down the exposed corner posts, coruscated above the shelf and mantel, and infected the very doors and furniture. Each minute saw it strengthen, and at last it was very plain that healthy living things must leave that house. Ami showed them the back door and the path up through the fields to the ten-acre pasture. They walked and stumbled as in a dream and did not dare look back till they were far away on the high ground. They were glad of the path, for they could not have gone from the front way by that well. It was bad enough passing the glowing barn and sheds and those shining orchard trees with their gnarled, fiendish contours. But thank heaven the branches did their worst twisting high up. The moon went under some very black clouds as they crossed the rustic bridge over Chapman's Brook, and it was blind groping from there to the open meadows. When they looked back toward the valley and the distant gardener place at the bottom, they saw a fearsome sight. All the farm was shining with a hideous unknown blend of color, trees, 
buildings, and even such grass and herbage that had not been wholly changed to lethal gray brittleness. The boughs were all straining skyward, tipped with tongues of foul flame, and lambent trickings of the same monstrous fire were creeping about the ridgepoles of the house, barn, and sheds. It was a scene from a vision of fusilli, and over all the rest reigned that riot of luminous amorphousness, that alien and undimensioned rainbow of cryptic poison from the well. Seething, feeling, lapping, reaching, scintillating, straining, and malignly bubbling in its cosmic and unrecognizable chromaticism. Then, without warning, the hideous thing shot vertically up toward the sky like a rocket or a meteor, leaving behind no trail and disappearing through a round and curiously regular hole in the clouds before any man could gasp or cry out. No watcher can ever forget that sight, and Ami stared blankly at the stars of Cygnus Deneb twinkling above the others, where the unknown color had melted into the Milky Way. But his gaze was the next moment called swiftly to Earth by the crackling in the valley. It was just that, only a wooden ripping and cracking, and not an explosion as so many others of the party vowed. Yet the outcome was the same, for in one feverish kaleidoscopic instant there burst up from that doomed and accursed farm a gleamingly eruptive cataclysm of unnatural sparks and substance, blurring the glance of the few who saw it and sending forth to the zenith a bombarding cloudburst of such colored and fantastic fragments as our universe must needs disown. Through quickly reclosing vapors, they followed the great morbidity that had vanished, and in another second, they had vanished too. Behind and below was only a darkness to which the men dared not return, and all about was a mounting wind which seemed to sweep down in black, frore gusts from interstellar space. It shrieked and howled and lashed the fields and distorted woods in a mad cosmic frenzy, till soon the trembling party realized it would be no use waiting for the moon to show what was left down there at Nahum's. Too odd to even hint theories, the seven shaking men trudged back toward Arkham by the north road. Ami was worse than his fellows and begged them to see him inside his own kitchen instead of keeping straight on to town. He did not wish to cross the blighted, wind-whipped woods alone to his home on the main road, for he had had an added shock that the others were spared and was crushed forever with a brooding fear he dared not even mention for many years to come. As the rest of the watchers on the tempestuous hill had stolidly set their faces toward the road, Ami had looked back an instant at the shadowed valley of desolation, so lately sheltering his ill-starred friend. And, from that stricken, faraway spot, he had seen something feebly rise, only to sink down again upon the place from which the great shapeless horror had shot into the sky. It was just a color, but not any color of our earth or heavens. And because Ami recognized that color and knew that this last faint remnant must still lurk down there in the well, he has never been quite right since. Ami would never go near the place again. It was 44 years now since the horror happened, but he has never been there and will be glad when the new reservoir blots it out. I shall be glad too, for I do not like the way the sunlight changed color around the mouth of that abandoned well I passed. I hope the water will always be very deep, but even so, I shall never drink it. I do not think I shall visit the Arkham country hereafter. Three of the men who had been with Ami returned the next morning to see the ruins by daylight, but there were not any real ruins. Only the bricks of the chimney, the stones of the cellar, some mineral and metallic litter here and there, and the rim of that Nefanda swell save for Ami's dead horse, which they towed away and buried, and the buggy, which they shortly returned to him. Everything that had ever been living had gone. Five eldritch acres of dusty, gray desert remained, nor has anything ever grown there since. To this day, it sprawls open to the sky, like a great spot eaten by acid in the woods and fields, and the few who have ever dared glimpse it in spite of the rural tales have named it the Blasted Heath. The rural tales are queer. They might be even queerer if city men and college chemists could be interested enough to analyze the water from that disused well or the gray dust that no wind ever seems to disperse. 
botanists too, ought to study the stunted flora on the borders of that spot, for they might shed light on the country notion that the blight is spreading, little by little, perhaps an inch a year. People say the color of the neighboring herbage is not quite right in the spring, and that the wild things leave queer prints in the light winter snow. Snow never seems quite so heavy on the blasted heath as it is elsewhere. Horses, the few that are left in this motor age, grow skittish in the silent valley, and hunters cannot depend on their dogs too near the splotch of grayish dust. They say the mental influences are very bad, too. Numbers went queer in the years after Nahum's taking, and always they lacked the power to get away. Then the stronger-minded folk all left the region, and only the foreigners tried to live in the crumbling old homesteads. They could not stay, though, and one sometimes wonders what insight beyond ours their wild, weird stories of whispered magic had given them. Their dreams at night, they protest, are very horrible in that grotesque country. And surely the very look of the dark realm is enough to stir a morbid fancy. No traveler has ever escaped a sense of strangeness in those deep ravines, and artists shiver as they paint thick woods whose mystery is as much of the spirits as of the eye. I myself am curious about the sensation I derived from my one lone walk before Ami told me his tale. When twilight came in, I had vaguely wished some clouds would gather, for odd timidity about the deep skyey voids above had crept into my soul. Do not ask me for my opinion. I do not know. That is all. There was no one but Ame to question. For Arkham people will not talk about the strange days, and all three professors who saw the aerolite and its colored globule are dead. There were other globules. Depend upon that. One must have fed itself and escaped, and probably there was another which was too late. No doubt it is still down the well. I know there was something wrong with the sunlight I saw above that miasmal brink. The rustics say the blight creeps an inch a year, so perhaps there is a kind of growth or nourishment even now. But whatever demon hatchling is there, it must be tethered to something, or else it would quickly spread. Is it fastened to the roots of those trees that claw the air? One of the current Arkham tales is about fat oaks that shine and move as they ought not to do at night. What it is, only God knows. In terms of matter, I suppose the thing Ami described would be called a gas, but this gas obeyed laws that are not of our cosmos. This was no fruit of such worlds and suns as shine on the telescopes and photographic plates of our observatories. This was no breath from the skies whose motions and dimensions our astronomers measure to deem too vast to measure. It was just a color out of space, a frightful messenger from unformed realms of infinity beyond all nature as we know it, from realms whose mere existence stuns the brain and numbs us with the black extra cosmic gulfs it throws open before our frenzied eyes. I doubt very much if Ami consciously lied to me, and I do not think his tale was a freak of madness, as the town folk had forewarned. Something terrible came to the hills and valleys on that meteor, and something terrible, though I know not in what proportion, still remains. I shall be glad to see the water come. Meanwhile, I hope nothing will happen to Ami. He saw so much of the thing, and its influence was so insidious. Why has he never been able to move away? How clearly he recalled those dying words of Nahum's. Can't get away. Draws you. You know something's coming, but tain't no use. Ami is such a good old man. When the reservoir gang gets to work, I must write the chief engineer to keep a sharp watch on him. I would hate to think of him as the gray, twisted, brittle monstrosity which persists more and more in troubling my sleep. That was The Color Out of Space by H.P. Lovecraft, originally published in September 1927 in Amazing Stories. We all love stories that get passed down from generation to generation, but do we ever really think to find out the truth and the terror behind them? Thanks for listening. Please join us again in our next episode as we continue our exploration into the pulp science fiction universe. 
please leave a rating and review, and we will see you in the future.